Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Vanessa Rose. Thank you so much for tuning in to join us for another great edition today. Today, we are so happy to be joined by David Martinez III, and he is the Advocacy and Outreach Specialist for St. Mary's Food Bank Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. Thank you so much. Great to be here. It's wonderful to have you. We're going to be speaking about homelessness today, um, something that your organization deals with every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get started with that, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself so the viewers know who you are and a little bit of your history and background. Sure. Well, I have the great opportunity to work at St. Mary's Food Bank Alliance, which is the world's first food bank. A lot of people don't know that. It was the entire concept of food banking started here in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, by a gentleman uh, that is a, a modern day saint. His name is John Van Hengel. He passed away in 2005, but his energy definitely still resonates in the walls of the, of the food bank. Um, so in 1967, he volunteered every night at a uh, dinner meal site and would often see the same woman with her uh, children and uh, receiving a free meal. And he asked her, what do you do besides come to the center to get a free meal with your kids? And she said, you would be surprised what grocery stores dump out at every night, at the end of every day. Um, so she was essentially dumpster diving. Wow. And he says, well, that's not right. There needs to be a way where a grocery store can uh, deposit or donate their excess product and those that are in need can withdraw it just like we do with money in a bank. So that's why we're called a food bank. So John Van Hengel in 1967 started that idea, went to St. Mary's Basilica in downtown Phoenix and that's why we're called St. Mary's Food Bank um, because they gave him the initial investment to begin this, this concept. And he often says it's crazy this little thing we started and what it's become because that first year he distributed about 250,000 pounds of food in that first year, which is wow, a lot of food. Yes. One pound is generally one meal. Now that's what we do in one day. Wow. So we've grown a lot in the nearly 50 years we've been in existence. How interesting. For all of our viewers, I didn't know that. That was something you told me before we started. Food Bank started right here in our beautiful Valley of the Sun. That mm -hmm. is so interesting to hear. I had no idea. I mean, that's. I think that's a great pioneering effort on the wonderful minds of Arizona here. <laughs> Absolutely. So how long have you been with the organization? I'm going on my fifth year at, at the food bank. I started working in our trial nutrition programs, helping them grow, uh, which is something that's really important to me. I'm a teacher by training, uh, originally from southern Arizona, born and raised in Marana. I'm one of six kids, so we went to after-school programs in a, in a lower mid, mid, middle income neighborhood, uh, working class families, so I would receive school meals and after-school meals and go to a summer program and get meals. I remember we would have this program called uh, the Burgers and Books, where we would get a free, uh, free meal and uh, the library would come down with the bookmobile and give us that education enrichment, which was great. Um, and I just wanted to give back uh, to, and continue to give back and the opportunity to help build our child nutrition programs at the food bank presented itself and um, I just fell in love. It's something that I really enjoy doing and now I get the opportunity to advocate on behalf of the food bank for child nutrition programs and some of the initiatives that we, we have. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time then mm -hmm. to be here, David, and for everything that uh, the organization is doing here in the Valley. So thank you. And for our viewers that are watching, today we are speaking about homelessness, and our first issue is homelessness in Arizona. Um, this is something that I always enjoy doing shows on homelessness mm -hmm. here because it's something that is so easy for people to forget. Uh, it becomes the person you drive by on the side of the road and mm -hmm. don't pay attention to or that you don't see. Sure. It's even more than that person, though, that you see standing on the side of the road. What does homelessness look like in Arizona? Absolutely. Uh, it is definitely that person that you, you see uh, on, the, on the street corners, um, and those are folks that are chronically homeless. So folks that have been living on the streets without a warm bed and, and shelter uh, for a few years. Um, but uh, surprising um, information about homelessness in Arizona is that it's not just uh, those, those folks. Um, it's folks that we otherwise wouldn't think about being homeless. In Arizona, there are about 40,000 of our neighbors who uh, don't have a warm bed to sleep in, um, mm -hmm. a roof over their head. Um, and that's, that, that's 40,000 Arizonans who every night are not going to bed in a safe, reliable place. Um, and these are people that we, we see on the streets, certainly that suffer from chronic homelessness, um, but they're, they're often uh, veterans. They're often senior citizens. Um, they're often families with children, which is uh, one of the most heartbreaking statistics. About 40% of that 40,000 number 
are families with children living on the streets. Wow, and so these are people that are still in school that may, you may even work with, you may not know their situation. Homelessness isn't secluded just to people that we see out there that we would never assume. These are people that, so like living in a car, living in something like that, that's considered homelessness in that statistic, correct? It is, yeah. So uh, without a, a safe, reliable uh, home shelter, these are also folks that live in transitional shelters, so mm -hmm. um, homeless shelters or domestic violence shelters, which is a big piece of it. About 4,000 adults and 4,000 kids um, are considered homeless and living in a domestic violence shelter. So they're out of that dangerous situation, but they're still in this unstable environment um, while they get, try to get back on their feet with the great community partners that we have that are addressing that issue. So homelessness is something that impacts food and hunger and issues of that nature. What does hunger look like? How does that affect these people? Are the statistics similar? Very similar. So about uh, 40,000 Arizonans are, are homeless uh, in this past year. Um, it's, a, it's a number that's hard to quantify, but that's the best that the state has been able to do. Um, we distribute about 40,000 food boxes of emergency food at the food bank every day. So that is um, at our door on the west side of Phoenix and in our location in Surprise and in uh, Flagstaff through our uh, partner agencies. Um, but a lot of that is done through our community partners. We would not be able to do what we do serving uh, the hungry and the homeless of Arizona if it wasn't for our community partners and generous, generous Arizonans. Um, so the, the numbers are pretty, pretty similar. Um, it's this bigger poverty picture that we're looking at. Um, what we say in Arizona is, is four, five, and seven. One, more than one in four children in Arizona go to bed hungry every night. One in five adults uh, cannot afford enough to take care of themselves and their families for their meals. And one in seven seniors have to make the difficult decision of paying for their medication or for food. So uh, one in four kids, one in five adults, and one in seven seniors. And that's one thing that food banking does, though, is because there's been so much waste in the past. If food banking takes the food from grocery stores, from restaurants, from different places, and they give the food so then it can be eaten. Is that, that, that's, that's the concept behind that, correct? That is the concept. Uh, this past year, uh, the food bank and our community partners distributed about 68 million pounds of food, which wow. is a staggering number. Uh, the economic recession here in Arizona hit us, hit everybody really hard, and we definitely saw those numbers reflected at our door. Even now, in the summer months of Arizona, um, it's a bit more hunger rises, especially with families with children, because children would otherwise get school meals. But when school's not in session, uh, they have to uh, turn to another source for those for those meals. Um, families' budgets are also stretched because they have to pay for childcare or um, expenses that uh, that. A During lot of parents year. will know. Exactly, yeah. right. So, so we're seeing about seven to 800 folks just at our doors at the, at, at the food bank. So it's a staggering number that, that we're seeing. Wow, and so it's, it's affected then seasonally and I'm sure the amount of water that needs to be consumed because it's so hot. And um, what are some of the actions that food banks and different nonprofit organizations are taking to address homelessness and hunger here in Arizona? Sure. So we definitely are still collecting food from grocery stores and from uh, government programs, um, from local farmers and ranchers, which is fantastic because in, here in the Valley of the Sun and throughout Arizona, we have a huge um, agriculture industry. About a third of the product that we get in at the food bank and distribute it is fresh fruits and vegetables, which is fantastic because we want to ensure that the food that we're distributing is not only making up a full meal, but it's making up a nutritious meal. And when uh, produce prices are a little bit expensive, we think when we're at the grocery store, things are a little bit expensive now. Uh, it's great that we're able to provide those, that fresh produce, that nutritious uh, source of food to Arizona families in need. We collect about two million pounds of food just from food drives, which is fantastic. Wow. These are churches, these are schools, these are sometimes kids throwing a birthday party and instead of getting gifts for themselves, they're asking folks to uh, bring a canned food and wow. they give it to the food bank. So so it's really, in a way, it's, it's, it's a community effort. It's everyone coming together and helping those that are less fortunate and in a situation that really 
any of us could unfortunately be put in at any time and that's one thing that you were saying is who are the homeless who who are these people what is the face of homelessness because right. a lot of times again people that it, at, maybe out of ignorance mm -hmm. that don't know that haven't been down to the shelters that haven't dealt with these people might think that oh they just don't want to work or they don't do something but these are people that maybe have just hit a tough spot in their life or with right. the recession that hit what 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 is the face of homelessness here Right, there are um, a lot of stories that we see at the at the doors of, of the food bank and through our, our partner agencies throughout the state. Um, in particular, uh, this this couple that actually uh, moved to Phoenix, um, moving wanting to seek a better life um, from the East Coast to the West. Um, on their on their bus ride home uh, here, um, they had everything that they owned, um, and at one of the stops, they had everything stolen from them, uh, wow. and it was it's uh, they were kind of left helpless. They weren't sure what to do. So they uh, continued uh, their trek uh, to the west and landed in Phoenix. Um, and while they were trying to get on their feet, um, they uh, decided to go to the food bank. Um, Dan and Angel are their names. And Dan in particular mentioned this, this story that's uh, it's really heartbreaking because it's something that you don't really think about. And he said that um, while him and Angel were on the streets, he found a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the, on the ground and thought to himself, this is not good food, but I am so hungry. So we, he had to make that decision to potentially uh, put something in his stomach that where nothing existed um, that wasn't good for him, that may have maybe poisoned or just a, a peanut butter or, jelly yeah. sandwich on the floor, right? Um, and he, but he was so hungry that he ate it. Um, thankfully, he's okay, and now they're getting back on their feet here in Phoenix. Wow, and so, but they were a couple that just everything was taken and mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily by their choice. It's something that really unfortunately could happen to anyone and I guess it makes be one of us, if someone's sitting in a home and watching a television right now, how blessed are we, you know, that we don't have to go try to find a sandwich on the floor or try right. to feed ourselves in some way. Um, what, what would your, uh, what, what, what would your suggestion be working with homeless people? What is something, even, even if it's just something on a personal level, that someone can do from the need that you see to, to help the homeless here in Arizona? What's, where, where can someone start? Um, I would recommend that people just become educated. Open their, open their hearts a bit. Um, don't pass judgment on somebody mm -hmm. they see. Um, and understand these, th these folks are, are, are vulnerable. They're certainly a vulnerable population in our community that are on the fringes and just trying to seek resources to, uh, to get themselves back on their feet. Um, people that come to the food bank certainly aren't proud to be there. Um, it's at a really low point in their lives and we're just glad to be able to provide that resource to them and help them get back on their feet so that they can take care of themselves mm -hmm. and their families. So it's just keep your, keep your heart open and know that a lot of the folks that are experiencing hunger and homelessness could be our neighbors or um, uh, the, our child's friend or a person that we're sitting next to in the pew. It really could be anybody. So we can't pass judgment or uh, shed a, a negative light on any of that. And these are folks that are just finding themselves in a, in a really bad um, situation. So they're living paycheck to paycheck, um, or th they certainly have a living wage, and, um, or they they're, have a job, but that job may not have benefits. So their child or themselves could end up with a, an unforeseen medical bill. Um, or their car breaks down and they have to spend what money they would otherwise spend on food on getting their car fixed so that they can continue to go to work. Wow. So it's those small expenses that can add up and uh, devastate a family's already tight budget. And when you have to make a decision on getting a car fixed to go to your job to continue to earn uh, uh, the resources needed to take care of your family, you're going to do that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, David, for all the work that you're doing here in the community, and thank you for taking the time to be here. If our viewers have any questions, would like to know any more information, there's great resources on the website. You can visit that. It's been at the bottom of the screen. Please don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this short message. In foster care, there are a lot of labels.
welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Vanessa Rose. Thank you so much for staying with us. If you just happen to be joining us, today we are joined by David Martinez III, and he is the Advocacy and Outreach Specialist for St. Mary's Food Bank Alliance. Um, thank you so much for staying with us, David. My pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to be here. We just spoke about what homelessness looks like here in Arizona. Um, Really something that I think that we can all take from that, that I took from it, is just, you know, be aware and realize that as being in our neighborhood, it's really our job to, t to help take care of our brother and to help take care of people and to realize that everyone has a story and everyone has somewhere where they came from. Um, and this is even more true for this next topic because we're discussing homelessness's effect on youth. And this goes to show that this is not their choice. They were brought into this world and they may be in a family where a situation has happened that they, that is far beyond their control because they're the innocent and therefore they don't have control over being homeless. Um, this is something that is truly heartbreaking mm -hmm. to think about the fact that there are children out there that don't have a place to sleep, that are hungry, that don't have anywhere to be. Right. Um, how are youth impacted by hunger and homelessness in Zerno? What, 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 are the, what do the numbers look like with that? Right. In the annual report that the state of Arizona puts out, they document to the best of their ability how many total homeless Arizonans there are. And in that, they look at uh, homeless youth as well. These are youth that could be youth on their own um, because of uh, situations where they may be kicked out of their house or they run away, and that's about 700. Um, and this wow. is unfortunate because it's sort of this notion that we're all God's children. So there's just situations that happen where they um, are um, disowned by their parents or guardians and left uh, to take care of themselves on, on the streets. Um, also just, um, again, families uh, with children, 40% uh, of that 40,000 homelessness number are uh, families that are homeless that have children. And also there's a program that's called the McKinney Vento program that's operated in schools throughout Arizona and throughout the country that um, have a, uh, that allow homeless children to be connected with the homeless liaison uh, in each school and in each school district so they can be provided the resources um, to, to uh, ensure that they succeed in school. So you see this a lot when uh, uh, children are having to double up at a friend's house or stay with an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent um, and it's a, it's a unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in. Um, it's sort of like a, one of our clients that stopped by the food bank. Her name was Jennifer and her husband, working class, uh, works, worked 70 hours a week, hard worker, and then uh, suffered a stroke. And uh, mm. is, is, was doing okay, but he definitely had to roll back some of his work hours by doctor's orders. So instead of 70 hours a week, he worked 40 hours a week. But that wasn't enough to put food on the table. Him and his wife Jennifer had uh, had uh, three kids, and um, they were struggling a bit. So they found themselves at the food bank trying to get food to take care of themselves and their families. And we were able to provide that to to them. Um, still, it's difficult because families like Jennifer, in a situation like a story she shared with, it was uh, one of her child's birthdays, and the child said, "No, it's fine. You don't have to get me a birthday present because I know we're struggling to put food on the table." And to hear that from a kid wow. is. A kid should not have to worry where no. the next meal is coming from. They should be worried about learning and playing and growing about what kids should be worried about, yeah. right? And unfortunately, that's not the case with kids who are suffering from hunger and homelessness. About 29% of kids in Arizona don't know where the next meal is coming from. Wow. So that, that would be considered food insecurity then. So about 29% of youth are experiencing food insecurity. Right. That's something, um, food insecurity, would you mind explaining that for viewers, for people that aren't familiar with that term and what that means? Sure, it's a, kind of a wonky term, if you will, food insecurity, but it simply is boiled down to not having the resources to, to pay for your meals um, okay. or to access fresh, nutritious meals. So this could be because you don't have uh, the, the monetary resources or that you simply don't have the access. There's not a grocery store near your, your home or your residence that you can access fresh, nutritious food to take care of, of your, yourself or your family. Okay, and one thing you mentioned is that whenever kids aren't in school, they are having issues um, with food. And this is something um, we've had several different organizations on here in charter schools and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And they deal with, uh, with, the inner, with the inner city communities. And they have noticed that 
whenever their kids go home for the summer, they try to do what they can. I think they've actually partnered with St. Mary's before and have gotten right. food to try to send home with the students or to try to set up a pickup time like once a month or something at least mm -hmm. because these kids are going home and they're coming back at the beginning of the school year and they talk about, you know, they're, they're starving because right. they haven't been eating or they've been going to a friend's house and having a bite or something. Mm -hmm. um, how, how was that dealt with and what's being done to address that issue? Sure, there are a lot of uh, different child nutrition programs that exist um, throughout Arizona. So certainly school meals are a, a top defense against child hunger, so school breakfast and school lunch. But as you mentioned, when the school bell rings on Friday afternoon and kids go home for the weekend, they may be going home uh, to an empty refrigerator. So we have a, a program called the Weekend Backpack Program, where we partner with um, uh, schools and, and uh, uh, charter schools as well and distribute um, about 800 or so backpacks every week uh, to children who would go home and not have meals until they go back to school on Monday morning for breakfast. So they would go two whole days without, without having meals. Wow. So we send them home with a backpack with uh, non-perishable, mostly single serve, uh, pop top kind of meals so that they can en enjoy over the weekend. Uh, we also have an after school and summer meal program um, which is great because once that school bell rings again, they may be going to an after school program to continue to learn and grow and play like a kid should, um, but they're able to get that dinner meal after school. And again, this is important because the 29% number that we mentioned, these are kids that are going home and not having a dinner. They're going to bed hungry. And the next time they have meals is when they go back to school the next morning and get breakfast. That number spikes during the summer because school's not in session, as you mentioned. So when the school bell rings and, and school year ends uh, in the spring, they don't have school meals to go to. So where do they go? It's a great question. About 500,000 or so kids in Arizona qualify for free or reduced price lunches during the school year, and only about 12%, so only about 50,000 kids or so are accessing summer meals, and that's a really big uh, problem that we're trying to work with at the food bank by offering our Kids Cafe summer meal programs. We're distributing more than 5,000 meals every day at more than 100 sites throughout the Valley of the Sun and up in Flagstaff. And we are pushing a lot as part of a, a coalition, the Arizona Child Nutrition Coalition, that we're working with schools, other food banks, um, other child nutrition advocates to raise awareness of the issue of child hunger and the importance of these child nutrition programs. And that's really important now because all of these programs are being reauthorized in Congress this year. So oh. we're urging uh, our members of Congress to visit one of our summer meal sites or after school meal sites, become educated about the issue of child hunger and support these really important programs. Is that something that our Congress and legislature and all that here in Arizona and nationally, is that something that they're paying attention to and they're trying to make laws and things enacted to help that? Absolutely, we've been really well received by our members of Congress, especially uh, two that serve on the committee on the, the House of Representative sides in Congress that uh, will reauthorize the, the, the language initially, and that's Representative Raul Grijalva, who represents the Congressional District 3, mostly Tucson and Southwest Valley of Phoenix over to Yuma, and then Representative Matt Salmon, who represents Congressional District 5 in the East Valley part of the Valley of the mm -hmm. Sun. Um, and we've met with both their staff members and them to shed some light on child hunger, and they've been receptive about supporting these programs and helping us make them stronger so that we can, making, we can make sure that we're focused not on uh, doing the paperwork of the programs, but actually outreaching to ensure that those participation rates are increased during the summer and kids uh, don't go hungry during the summer. That is, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, just for, briefly, tell me a little bit about children's nutrition and what you're doing with that and how that affects kids in homelessness and in school and in hunger. Right. Um, child hunger is a pretty complex issue, but we, we try to simplify it as much as possible. We say a hungry child um, can be identified as easily as A, B, and C. A hungry child's A appearance is impacted. Um, we know that they often lose weight because they're not getting the nutrients they need from the meals that they, they should be receiving as a growing mm -hmm. child. Um, and on the verse side, we see that a hungry child may become obese or morbidly obese because they're resorting to much more affordable um, but less nutritious meals, often at a, at a value, uh, at value meal at a mm -hmm. fast food place or something like that. So their A, appearance is impacted. Um, their B, behavior is impacted. Um, a kid who is worried about where the next meal is coming from um, or uh, the growling of their stomach 
um, is a bit more anxious and aggressive. Um, and that behavior impacts their C coursework. So we hear this all the time from teachers and school officials saying, kids are hungry in our classroom and they're not uh, behaving, they're not paying attention, so their, their coursework um, suffers and they're not able to learn as they should. Also because their brain isn't developing because mm -hmm. they're not getting the nutrients they need. And that's even if they're making it to school in the first place. We know that a hungry child is more likely to go to the doctor's office or to the emergency room because they suffer from a, a frail, or a broken bone or fractured bone because they're not getting the milk, say, that they need to, to make sure that they're strong and growing. So a hungry child, uh, ABC is, is what we say. We know it has a direct impact. So one of the things that we do is serve fresh fruits and vegetables. And as part of our uh, child nutrition advocacy uh -huh. efforts and educating about that, we have um, kids in our uh, Kids Cafe Summer Meal Program draw on a lunch sack, a brown lunch Aww. sack that represents uh, a lunch sack that they don't bring to school um, because 29% uh, are food insecure. Are so we have one here that Adrian, 10 years old, drew with some of his favorite fruits and vegetables, apple, pears, uh, pretty good bananas, strawberries, well, watermelon. Well, that's good because otherwise he probably wouldn't have had those <laughs> produce. And I, I hate to, to cut this short, David. There's yeah. so many wonderful, so much wonderful information, so many great things you're giving. And I wish that we could have talked a little bit more about that. But thank you so much for taking the time to be mm -hmm. here and for what you're doing and especially advocating for our youth here and our hungry youth here in, uh, in Arizona. So so for all of our viewers, if you would like to know more information, the website is at the bottom of the screen. Thank you so much, as always, for watching. I hope you go out and look at the world a little bit differently because everyone has a story. And I hope today has brought some joy into your town, and we'll see you next week. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.